Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful just for the privilege that we have to gather together as brothers and sisters in, in this sanctuary. And Father, we're here to worship and to glorify your name. And Father, we have the privilege of um, sitting and listening to the reading of your word and the preaching of your word. And Father, we recognize, O oh God, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and light unto our path. And God, we're so in need of your word this morning, O oh God. Even as we, are, we see this passage that we'll be focused on, I pray that you prepare our hearts. I pray, O oh God, for those who may be struggling with guilt. I pray, O oh God, that you would free them through this word. And I pray that we would see your grace abounding bountifully. Father, I have prepared, but I need your help. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So God, God is faithful to fulfill his promises, despite us. Church, when God makes a promise, he will keep his promise, even in seasons when we mess up. I feel like someone needs to hear that again. When God makes a promise, he will keep his promise, even when we mess up. You know, as we continue our study through the book of Genesis, Today we arrive at Genesis chapter 20. And you know, a few months before Genesis chapter 20, we actually learn in Genesis chapter 18 that Abraham, God actually gave Abraham and Sarah a date when this promise that they were looking forward to would be fulfilled. And the promise was that Sarah would give birth to a son, and that son would make Abraham a father of many nations. So, I mean, humanly speaking, church, this was all they've been living for. This promise is all they're desiring. However, in chapter 19, two events happen that really rock their world. You know, God judged Sodom. And as God judged Sodom, the Bible says Abraham stood and looked and saw Sodom and the cities around it went up in flames. And Abraham's nephew, Lot, was actually rescued from the fire. But very shortly after, him and his two daughters committed incest. And you know, after all of this happened, Abraham and Sarah packed up all of their possessions, and they moved away from Hebron, where they lived. And they moved south towards the desert to reside in a place called Gerar. And so Abraham and Sarah moved into this foreign land. And we learn later on in the text that Abraham, he was afraid. And overcome by his fear, Abraham repeated a horrible sin. And this church brings us to our big idea for this lesson, which is, despite our sins, God protects and he preserves his own. Despite our sins, God protects and he preserves his own. Now, as we work our way through this text and we consider this big idea, as we seek to unpack what it means for us today, we're going to consider three observations. And we will pay attention to each observation as the text unfolds. So our first observation this morning, church, is that Abraham and Sarah sinned. Abraham and Sarah sinned. Now in verse 2 it says, And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, keyword wife, <laughs> she is my sister. She is my sister. Now why would he do this? And, and I know from, for many of us here, it's almost like this is like deja vu, right? We were, we're, we're, the thought is, we have seen this before. You know, 24 years before this scene here, Abraham, who he was called Abraham, and Sarai, they went to Egypt. And you know, before they actually went into the land of Egypt, Abraham was afraid. And Abraham came up with a, a master plan, being, being the awesome hus husband that he was. He, he was planning for his great entry into Egypt. 
But unfortunately, his plan was only about himself. Abraham wanted to preserve himself. And his plan was one that included, if necessary, I would give up my wife. You may wonder, why would he think in that way? You know, that's the thing about sin, church. Sin can lead us down some path that we would never dream that we would ever go down. But what's interesting is that Sir Abraham actually planned to do this. And the way that they devised the scheme, Abraham pressured his wife into agreeing that when they go into foreign territory, and if there is a risk that she should say he, she was her, I mean, his uh, sister. But church, to some degree, that was partially true. Because Abraham's wife was actually the daughter of his father. And that's a whole different um, sermon for another time. <laughs> but he decided to not disclose that Sarah was his wife. Because Sarah was beautiful and he was concerned that Sarah would cut the eyes of the other man and potentially the king, and they would kill him and take his wife. And you know what's interesting? 24 years after, we see Abraham repeating that sin. Abraham repeated that sin. I mean, they went there and his wife was taken from him. Pharaoh took away his wife. And God actually brought a plague on the land of, of Egypt and on Pharaoh. And when Pharaoh found out that this was what had caused it, he kicked them out of the land and told them to leave and take everything they, that they had and leave. And here we have, we see um, Abraham repeating the same thing again. You know, one of the lessons that I would like us to consider this morning is that no matter how mature we are in the faith, no matter how, much, how many times you serve in different ministry, no matter how many times you, you preach from the pulpit, at every point in our journey as believers in Jesus Christ, we are prone to sin. Now, it is important that we understand that when you are in Christ, you're washed with the blood of Christ. You are free from the bondage of sin. But you are prone to sin because the old man still remains. So the difference is, before Christ, you had no choice but to sin. But after the work of Christ, because of our, our flesh, we are still prone to sin. And we should not get complacent at any point in our journey because we're always prone to sin. I mean, think about this. Abraham, the father of the faith, right? Abraham, the person who walked with the Lord, the person who God confided in, we see him 24 years after repeating the same sin. What's interesting is that even at times in the Bible where there is an attempt to make a distinction between Yahweh, the true God, versus the false God, Oftentimes, you hear in Scripture that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's almost like Abraham is a brand name for the real God. And look at how Abraham was representing the brand, so to say. But I do want to share this with you. As much as Abraham was seen as the father of many nation, and the, the, the brand, so to say, that indicated who the real God was. The same God, Yahweh, is also the God of those who mess up. And we're going to see that today, because it's almost as if Abraham is like a two-sided coin. In one regard, he is, in fact, a man of faith who is faithful and a true example for us to look up to. But on the other side of the coin, he's a mere man. And here we are in this chapter, we're going to see how low this figure that we should emulate, how low he can go. But one thing I want to highlight about Abraham's sin church is that 
for Abraham sin, the thing that I want us to pay attention to is Abraham actually planned, planned to sin in this particular way. It's almost as if he hid this thing in a dark corner of his heart. And church, I want to caution us. Do not make any room for the enemy. It is just a matter of time. It took 24 years for the enemy or his flesh to rise up and seize this moment for the, the giant of the faith to fall in this way. Church, we cannot leave any in a hidden sin, any point of escape. Or full trust need to be in God. There shouldn't be, if God don't come true, I'm going to do this. That should not be a part of our vocabulary. Or full trust or full confidence should be in God and God alone. And what's interesting about this is we see Abraham here, right, selling out the promise, selling out the promise of God. Church, we can never measure the potential impact of our sin. You know, oftentimes when we sin, and I say when we sin because I know what it is to sin, we think that, okay, if I do this, I'm just hurting myself. Or if I do this, I'm going to take the risk, but, but this thing could potentially happen. I'm willing to accept that. But church, you can never calculate the potential devastating impact of sin. You know, oftentimes we find ourselves sinning and then the, the things come to, come, to, come to the surface. And we find that we, we're in a campaign going around apologizing to people. Because when Abraham made a decision, and I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, I am going to trust that Abraham did not necessarily think that um, the ramification would be so significant. Abraham lied, and his wife was taken from him. That resulted in Abimelech, the king of Gerar, being compromised. And he didn't even know. The people of Gerar was under God's judgment. And most importantly, the promise that you and I are depending on today was at risk of being compromised. Do you realize the significance of what Abraham did? Now, I can guarantee you that he wasn't thinking about the extent of this damage. And that's where we are typically when we sin. We underestimate the level of impact that our sin could have. And church, I would encourage us to consider that this morning. Because the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if you have sinned and you're here this morning and you're struggling with guilt even as you're hearing this, please know that you're in good company. You are in good company. Because if you look around the room, <laughs> you're in the company of fellow sinners. But we are sinners who are saved by grace. And even as we look on Abraham's life, your church, we are reminded that no matter how high or how far we go, we are still prone to sin. And I, I'm hoping that it would, in some regards, be a word of caution to us. Because I know that just like Abraham, there may be others of us that have been plotting, thinking, scheming because we are struggling to trust God. But receive this word as a word of grace for you this morning. It will not end well. It will not end well. But praise be to God that through the work of his son, even though our sin lead to one direction and one direction only, which is to death. But Jesus Christ's work on the cross rescue us. And he often, he, not often, he takes on, right, the full penalty of our sin. And we're going to see how God actually treats Abraham at his lowest point as this story unfolds. So that brings us to our second point this morning, which is, 
God protects his own. God protects his own. You know, as we transition from verses 2 to verse 3, the Bible says that, the Bible says, but God. You know, this word but here is a conjunction, but it says but God. It means that it used to, to, to create a contrast between what's happening in verse 2 and what is to come in verse 3 and onwards. It says, but God. Don't you just love when you're reading the Bible and you hear, but God? Most times when you hear, but God, it, happen, it comes right after someone, right? Some mere man, some mere woman does something. And then there's a, but God, that changes the script. And this morning, as we consider this, we see a but God. And this is what happened. In, in verse 3 it says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is another man's wife. You're a dead man. Now imagine this. Abraham sinned, and Sarah agreed to follow through with a lie. And you would think that God would be going to them. Look who God is going to. The king who is not even aware of what's really going on. And he approached Abimelech in a dream and he said, you are a dead man. Now listen, I, my wife, my wife is a dreamer. Every single night, Andrea dreams and she can tell you her dream. I'm not like that. I rarely dream and sometimes, most times when I dream, I don't even remember it. But there are some times, church, when I dream, and my dream is so intense that I literally wake up feeling the emotions as if it, it, it just happened. Well, church, that is the type of dream that Abraham was having. He had an encounter with the Almighty God. And, you know, as I was thinking about this, you know, you have king, the king of Gerera, right? The king of Gerar. A man of power, a man of prestige. But then he will he encounter the king of kings and the lord of lords. It is almost like the Philadelphia Eagles taking the field with, with Alf, Anne Frank Elementary School. By the way, that's my first Eagles um, analogy. I'm officially a pastor <laughs> of St. Mario Church. All right. <laughs> that was my ordination. <laughs> So here we have the king of king engaging with the king of Gerar. There was no match. And he said, listen, you are a dead man. And listen to the response of the king. He said, will you kill an innocent man? Did he not say that this was his sister? And did she not say that he was her brother? And later on it says, in the integrity of my heart and in the clean, cleanliness of my hand, I did not, I did not know this. I you know one interesting thing about Abimelech, and we'll see the contrast between Abimelech, at least in this particular um, uh, experience, and Abraham later on. Abimelech actually confessed. The words that he used indicated that he was taking ownership. But what he was saying is that, yes, I did take Sarah, but God, I didn't know. As a matter of fact, they told me something completely different. They omitted that very important information that would have influenced the decision that I made. And listen to God's response. God responded and said to Abimelech, I know. I know you're innocent. And God said, I have honored your integrity. Now think about this, church. If God would honor a pagan's king's integrity, how much more would he honor the integrity of his children? Now, it's interesting because what God is doing here is he actually said that, listen, I know and I've honored your integrity by actually restraining you. I actually prevented you from sinning against me. You know, in the society, church, we live in a society where it's built on this ide ideology of individual liberty and freedom, right? So the whole idea of, of being constrained is actually a bad word, right? The thought that you would be restricted in any form. As Americans, we are resistant to that idea. 
But church, I do want you to know that as believers in Jesus Christ, true freedom is clothed and covered in restraint. The right type of restraint. And you know, I remember when I was running track and field in, in, in college, one of my favorite races was um, the 4 by 100 meter. And you know, part of the reason why I love this race was it is, it's a team sport. To run a 4 by 100 meter, you had to have four people on your team. Not two, not seven, four. It doesn't matter how fast you can run or, or how slow you run, four. Every team had one lane to run in. Not two, one lane. As a matter of fact, if you step out of your lane, you would be disqualified from, from, from the race. Each team had one baton. And the goal was that the four persons would bring the baton around successfully. And I'm going to get a little bit technical on you here. <laughs> but even with exchange from one person to the next, there was an exchange zone. And if you step out of that zone, you would be, you would be um, eliminated as well. And each team had one finish line, not two, not three, but one. And whoever crosses that line first, assuming that they follow the other rules, would be considered the winner. And that would be irrefutable. The race is constrained by certain rules and the right appropriate restrictions. Church, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are to accept and celebrate the right type of restraint, which is God restraint. A friend shared this with me that I'll share with you. He said a fish, right? A fish, for a fish to truly be free, they have to be restrained to water. Now, if a fish have the audacity of, of stepping out of the water, what's going to happen? The fish is going to what? Die, right? Similarly, we should understand that the restraint that the Lord provides for us, that is where we flourish, church. That is where we thrive and we flourish. And whenever we take life into our own hands and seek to pursue our own liberty and freedom, so to say, that is when we get in trouble. But praise be to God, we have a God who, as he sees us, faith as small as a mustard seed, Integrity as small as Abimelech's. He is willing to honor that and to restrain us and to protect us from sinning against him. You know, what's interesting is, even when Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, the Bible says that Jesus taught the disciples to pray this. It says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Church, this faith journey is not about doing whatever we want and going wherever we, 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 we want to go and thinking whatever we want to think. No. This faith journey is about desiring God's direction to guide our path wherever he wants us to go, for him to direct our steps wherever he desires for us to go, or for us to even think the things that he desires for us to think. The Bible says, our thoughts are not his thoughts, and our ways are not his ways. So we are to pursue God's will for our lives. So we see God preserving Sarah in this vulnerable position. And one of the things that I shared earlier is that he restrained Abimelech. But listen, not only did he restrain him, by, um, protect her by restraining him, but he also directed Abimelech. In verse 7, and again, remember, this is God talking to the king, right? And he said, Know then, return this man's wife. And the Bible goes on to say or later on in the scripture that Abimelech moved with urgency, <laughs> right? 
So listen, the God whom we serve, when he speaks, kings move. The God who we, spur, we, 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 we serve, when he speaks, darkness turns into light. The God whom we serve, when he speaks, dead people comes back to life. The God whom we serve, sickness leaves the body, and the body is restored to health. So God, so, so, so church, if you are here this morning and you're struggling with guilt or you're struggling with sickness or, or whatever you may have weighing on your mind, know that we have a God who is able to protect us in all circumstances and just by him speaking a word or situation can completely be transformed. So Abraham and Sarah sinned, Right? But even in this, their sin, we see them, we see God directly intervening and protecting them. And most importantly, he is also, as he protects Sarah, he's protecting the promise. Well, here's a third observation, church. God preserves his own. God preserves his own. You know, as God instructs and warns Abimelech to return uh, Abraham's wife, he said something interesting. If you take a look at verse 7, it says, Return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. Do you realize what's happening here, church? Abraham's sin, in Abraham's sin sick state. I mean, Abraham couldn't go any lower than where he is. And in that moment, at that place, God is saying, he is my prophet. He is my prophet. Church, the Bible says there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I know oftentimes we hear those words and it just kind of go over our head. But please, would you pay attention today? If no other day, would you pay attention and receive that truth? Because we're here, again, we're looking at Abraham. And we're looking at him in his lowest place. And what is God saying? This is my man. This is my prophet. This is my minister. He did not disown him. Now I must say, if this was Abraham, um, if this news came on social media today, Abraham would be canceled, right? <laughs> so we just have to remind ourselves, church, that God functions in a whole different economy. And irrespective of what we do, God will never disown us because we're purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, what's interesting is as, Ab as, as, as God is, 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 is sharing this with Abimelech, he's doing more than what we are seeing on the surface. You know, God is actually doing a significant work in the heart of Abimelech. And God is actually working on Abimelech's heart for him to show favor to Abraham. Think about this. In this one statement, he said three things. One, he said that he's my prophet. He's my man. Right? Abraham is my man. You're talking about the king of kings. And you're talking about a guy that says, you're a dead man. <laughs> and he's saying, listen, this, this guy here is my, my guy. But then secondly, he's saying... He will pray for you. I have work for him to do, right? This guy have work ahead of him to do for the king of kings and the lord of lords. But then listen to the kicker. He's also saying, you shall live. In other words, as a result of his work, you are going to benefit directly. Now, talk about setting up for favor, church. Imagine those times when, when we know what we deserve and things just take a turn for the positive. When we canceled ourselves in our minds and we realize that things are actually working out. Do we believe that it's because of our own credit? I'm still trying to find where did Abraham do any of this to deserve such grace. But we see God here working on the art of, 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 of Abimelech and preparing him for what is to come. So as the, the passage progresses, I just want to leave you with this. 
You may be here, church, and you may have messed up the ministry. You, have messed up, you may have messed up your family. You, have messed up, you may have messed up on the job. Know that God is not disowning you. God has a work for you. And the very people who are you engaging with, they will benefit from that work. You are God's man. You are God's woman. So, you know, as the passage um, progresses, we see Abraham, uh, not Abraham, Abimelech actually waking up in the morning. And the Bible says that he woke up early. And that has, there's a, a double meaning there. One, it means that he literally woke up early, <laughs> right? But the other side of that is he moved with urgency. This was not one of those moments where he was going to sleep in. No. He, had, he was directed by the Almighty God. So he had to move with urgency. And he gathered all of his, all of his servants and, and he shared what happened. And the Bible said they were afraid. And after that, Abimelech knew that he needed to make things right with, with, with Abraham. And in verse 9 it says, Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you? That you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin. And listen what he says. You have done this, done to me things that ought not to be done. Church, the pagan king is correct, correcting or rebuking the prophet of God. How embarrassing. <laughs> I'm going to share an embarrassing story about myself. <laughs> Because I've had, I've had a similar experience. You know, when I was in college I, uh, 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 at the University of Wyoming, over 20 years ago, I, had, I bought my first car. It was a 1989 um, Acura Legend. Man, that car could drive so fast. I, I loved it. But you know, a broke college student, when you buy cars, you normally buy it with problems, right? So you had some problems. And the problem is, it had, the issues was, it had a brake issue. <laughs> now, my advice to you is if you're buying a car, buy a car that don't have brake issues, okay? <laughs> but anyway, I didn't know that that was what I was getting, but I know something was coming, and that, that is what, what it came with. So I was talking with a friend about it, and he recommended a mechanic. Now, as a broke college student, right, you're trying to just um, put two cents together. So this guy did mechanic work, kind of, so to say. <laughs> so anyway, I, went, I, I got his number, called him, and I went over and um, dropped out like, the car. He said he could get it done. He had all the tools, and... Anyway, <laughs> he, I went back to him. He said he fixed it. I drove off. It seemed fine. The following morning, I woke up. Same problem. Anyway, I reached out to him, called him multiple times, couldn't hear from the guy. Went back, and it's almost as if he literally kind of moved away. <laughs> and, man, I felt like I was so deceived, and I was angry. And I remember I went back, and I was talking with with my friend, and I was just venting my anger, and I was sharing, and, and just how, how, how upset I am. And I remember these words coming out of my mouth, and I said, I feel like I just punched this guy in his face. And listen, that's not how I typically handle my conflict, just, just so you know. <laughs> but that's what was, was what came out of my mouth. And when I said that, my friend stepped back and said, Jason, what are you saying? Stop it. That's not you. <laughs> this, this, this lady, right, a friend of mine, he's not a believer. Church, I was so embarrassed. The person who I should be modeling Christ to, those are the things that were coming out of my mouth. I was so embarrassed. And he, she rebuked me on the spot. And immediately, I just, I just felt so embarrassed. And church, that was what Abraham was experiencing in this moment. It was so embarrassing. Now, I'm not sure if he felt it. <laughs> But man, this was such an embarrassing situation. For the father of the faith to be corrected and rebuked, these things are not to be done. Imagine that. Imagine that. Anyway, again, we serve an amazing God that work on even the heart of the king. So here you have Abraham wronging this guy. And God said, I am going to, listen, if you move any step further, you're a dead man. And he comes back to Abraham. 
But guess what? He came back to Abraham prepared. God had prepared his heart. Yes, he called Abraham to the carpet. But he was talking to the man of God, and he knew it. He knew it. And as he confronted Abraham, and I remember I said earlier, Abraham, um, Abim, Abimelech took ownership for the sin that he committed. But when he confronted Abraham, listen to what Abraham said. He said, I did it because I thought there was no fear of God at all in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, through, though not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And if you read further, you will hear Abraham actually blaming God. Church, what's interesting, Abraham gets called to the carpet. And Abraham is pointing the fi his finger at the person who is challenging him and his people. Abraham is pointing back to his family history, blaming his, his background for what is happening. And then Abraham is pointing his finger at God, blaming God for moving him away from his family. Does that sound familiar, church? Isn't that we're, what we're prone to do? When we get challenged, when we get called to the carpet, oftentimes our gut reaction is to point the finger at others rather than to take ownership. I would encourage us to be open to take ownership and correction. That God would use people in our lives to correct us and we would receive it. That is, in some regards, one way that he restrains us. So my encouragement is that we would be receptive to God's correction, however it may come. So church, we see Abraham in a very low place, a very low place. He sinned, his wife was taken from him, he was challenged, and he's blaming others. Can you go much lower than that? But the beautiful thing about this church in this text, as we see Abraham going lower and lower and lower, we see the grace of God abounding more and more and more. Listen to what it says in, in verse 14. It says, Abimelech took sheep and ox, oxen, male servant and female servant, and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. Again, Abimelech took responsibility. God worked on his heart. And here um, Abimelech came under the influence of God, giving gifts, paying a, a price of restitution. It is like a, a, a court case that is tried and you have the guilty party that lost the lawsuit. They come and they, first of all, they pay for the, 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 the cost of whatever was damaged, but then they pay on top of that. And the additional payment in, in, in this particular text is to say to Abraham, I want to be in good standing with you. I am sorry. I am sorry for sinning against you. And I want to be in good standing with you. The other thing that we see happening here, we see in verse 15 where it says, My land is before you. Dwell where you, 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 you please. So Abimelech offered an offering of peace. This was a peace offering church that the king was offering. You remember back in, in Genesis chapter 12, where Pharaoh chased Abraham and Sarah and all his position, asked them to leave. In this case, God's favor worked it out for Abimelech to say to Abraham, choose wherever you may live. But it doesn't stop there. In verse 16, it says, Behold, and this is Abimelech speaking to actually Sarah. He said, Behold, I have given your brother, <laughs> interesting, even though, even though God had given Abraham, I mean, Abimelech um, favor, uh, 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 even though God gave Abraham favor in the eyes of Abimelech, it's almost like Abimelech could not get himself to say, this is your husband. <laughs> so he said, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence. So what this is, church, is this is actually an offering that says that Sarah was not touched. The promise was not compromised. 
And it was done in a way where anyone who knew about what happened would know that it was an actual demonstration that nothing actually happened. So God preserved not only Sarah, but God preserved the promise. Otherwise, there maybe would have been stories and questions around who's Isaac's father, <laughs> right? So God, again, preserved Sarah, Abraham, but he also preserved the promise, the integrity of the promise. So even as we continue in this, in this story here, church, and we're, we're here at our conclusion, you know, as we close, the, the, the big question that I'm sure many of us are grappling with is, how does Abraham sin and walk away with riches? Church, isn't that the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know, the Bible says, for those who are perishing, the gospel is foolishness. But for those of us who know Jesus Christ and are being saved, it is the power of God. Our life is marked by this example. We are sinners who are destined for destruction or who were destined for destruction. And while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us and gave us eternal and abundant life. And we all, all of us here who know Jesus Christ, have a taste of what that means that we are seeing playing out here. But you know what? As I was wrestling through this passage, church, I kept asking myself, was God doing this for the well-being of Sarah and Abraham? Or was God doing this to preserve his promise? I was, I was trying to figure out, okay, what was, what was the real reason why God was doing this? But where I landed, it was this. You cannot separate God's people from his promise and his purposes. It is almost like you're trying to take cold temperature out of ice. It will never happen. <laughs> right? God's people and his purpose are intertwined. The Bible says we are the body of Christ. And even when we're unfaithful, he will remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. So church, you may be here today and if you're here today and you're struggling with guilt, know that we are here because of the promise. We live, church, according to the promise, and we eagerly await the promise. You know, the promise was that Sarah and Abraham would give birth to a son, Isaac. And when Isaac was born, which was a chapter over, the promise was catalyzed, it began. And then years after that, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the promise was realized. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross and was crucified and buried, when he resurrected from the grave, the promise was culminated. And that is the reason, church, why we can come here this morning with confidence to say that despite our sins, God protects and preserves his own. Brothers and sisters, despite your sin, God protects and preserves his own. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful that you would be so merciful to us. You are gracious and merciful. Your grace and your mercy abound in ways that we would never even be able to explain. And Father, as we get a chance to look really at this embarrassing moment in the life of our brother and father, Abraham, though the moment was embarrassing, God, but we are so thankful that this is in the Scripture because all of us here this morning can testify that we have fallen short. But praise be to God, you do not dis disown us in our sin. We're so grateful, O oh God, that you'd be so merciful to us. When we look back at our record, there is nothing that we can point to to say that we deserve to sit at your table. But, O oh God, not only do you invite us to sit at your table, but you call us your children. And we're so grateful, God, 
Thank you for being so kind and merciful to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.